Yeah, the word of God as it comes to us from Psalm 30, the first five verses. Actually, let's read it together. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me up out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, I shouldn't have closed that. Um, now that we read those first five verses, I, I, I want you to, to hear Psalm 30, 11 and 12 as, as that finishes out. It says, You, Lord, turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. See, the psalmist was, was crying out for some kind of healing, and God provided. But that wasn't the end of the story. See, the psalmist returned to God acknowledging eternal gratitude. The, the provision of joy from God is the source of the psalmist's continual praise. Now, we don't know what ailed the psalmist. Uh, maybe it was an illness. Uh, maybe it was the, the healing of a, a broken relationship. Perchance it was salvation from some dire circumstance. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. What we do know is that the psalmist recognized God's hand in his deliverance. And gratitude filled his heart so much that he couldn't and wouldn't contain it. And, and arguably, the most important part of this psalm is that it was God who clothed the psalmist with joy. you got to hear that. It wasn't something the psalmist obtained on his own. It was God that clothed the psalmist with joy. See, joy is a gift that we receive from on high. God is the source of joy. The fruit of that gift is is, is that the psalmist calls everyone, hey, sing to the Lord the praise, okay? The psalmist realizes the trial, whatever it was, has ended reminding him as, as well as us that pain is temporary while God's favor is eternal. Now, how do we respond to that? Well, here we are, days away from Christmas morning, joy to the world, dreams of a white Christmas, Okay? We're almost ready, right? We, we are almost ready. We're almost at peace. We're almost hopeful. We're almost loving. And now we're almost joy-filled. Almost merry and bright. How many of you have heard of the, the blue Christmas? A couple of you? Okay. Uh, the, blue, the blue Christmas, not the song made famous by Elvis Presley. Okay, the, the holiday also called the longest night. Okay, it's a night when, when some churches honor people that have lost loved ones and, and are experiencing grief. The pain of loss is real, even in the midst of a very merry Christmas. And, and maybe especially uh, in the midst because of all of the pressure that is on people to be happy truth is that it's hard for many to find joy. It, it's even harder for, for many to admit that they are stuck living with this almost joy. You look around, and, and our world is filled with the pain of loss. Loss of life, loss of, of property, loss of health, loss of loved ones, loss of identity and passion and purpose. Those outside of the misery will, will assure us, oh, the trouble's going, you'll be okay. But those who are experiencing the strain, well, they, 
may not be so sure. The truth is, pain never seems temporary. It, it draws us into the present in such ways that we can't even begin to fathom a future. We, we simply find ourselves living moment to moment, minute to minute, and, and, and we're waiting for, for the pain to end before we can acknowledge the goodness of God with any kind of authenticity. I mean, is an answer to our prayer enough for us to sing our praise even once, let alone eternally like the psalmist? How many prayers have we ushered up to God from this holy space right here in the past month, in the, in the past year, since worship began here in this, in this holy place? If we were able to count, would, would our prayers outnumber our praises? And how is it that we can commit to asking without acknowledging? I think it happens inadvertently, doesn't it? We confuse joy and happiness. Happiness is lived out in the world and what's happening now. Happiness can take the form of an almost joy. I mean, our culture puts a huge emphasis on being happy. It, it's a key point, an inalienable right within the Declaration of Independence, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Great words. Happiness is something we go after. We pursue it. We, we, we seek to create it for our lives. It's something that we crave. But it's also something that's fleeting can't tell you how many people simply put are, are unhappy. Unhappy with their lives, with their circumstances, with their relationships, their, with, their, with their jobs. And, and they're at risk of sliding down this slippery slope. And, and maybe you can relate to that. They're convinced that, that God wants me to be happy. And I'm not. So, so what now? Well, the reality is, as I told the kids, God wants so much more for us than happiness. God doesn't want us, you or I, to settle for, for almost. Focus on finding happiness. Focusing on finding happiness actually holds us back. It holds us back from what God's really offering. And that's joy. We want a happiness that is, is pursuable and achievable and controllable. The problem with that is is that happiness obtainable by us is just as easily lost as it is gained. Because it's a feeling, it's an emotion. I, in many ways, we've made it a crapshoot. It, it depends on, on circumstances and situations. It, it depends on how we are treated or how we treat others. It relies on, on what we have rather than who we are. It's here today and gone tomorrow. And, and too often, we are content with this trivial pursuit of, of happiness, this almost joy. A guy by the name of Reverend Tim Keller, he's pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York. And, and he has this analogy. Do you remember when our moms used to say, don't eat candy before mealtime? And, and why did she say that? She said it because she knew it would ruin our next meal. Eating candy gives us this sugar buzz that steals our hunger. It's wonderful, but it steals our hunger. Candy masks the fact that our bodies need protein and vitamins to survive and thrive. The sugar in the candy masks that hunger for the real nutrients we need but we're not getting. So there are those things like sex and power and money and success, as well as favorable circumstances at work, at home, in every aspect of our lives. And all of these things act like this kind of a spiritual sugar. They steal our hunger for the real need in our lives. 
joy of Jesus Christ. Christians who fill themselves up on such spiritual candy, they undoubtedly say, yeah, I believe in God. I know I'm going to heaven. But they're actually basing their day-to-day well-being on the favorable circumstances that they can create or that they can opt into. They're looking for that daily dose of happiness, that fix of feel-good, and it's got nothing to do with God. They almost get it. However, when circumstances change, that fleeting failing, that fleeting feeling falls away. Too many F's in there. When you come down off of that spiritual candy high, where do you go? What do you do? Prayerfully, we're driven to God. Because when the sugar disappears and the candy gets taken away, when our happiness fades, we're forced to pursue the feast that our souls really crave. We find fulfillment at the heavenly feast of faithfulness. And we're going to hunger for the spiritual nutrients that we really need. You know what? God will provide. That's when we realize the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is lived in the world of what's happening now. Joy is the steadfast assurance That God is with us. Emmanuel. Joy is a gift that we receive. We can't manufacture it. We can't seek it out. We can't study it. We can only receive it. And God will provide. Matt Rowe explains it this way. He says, hope is a future destination for which we dream and and work. Peace is is a daily discipline to stop the fighting in whatever form it's being manifest. Love requires a selflessness in order to be shared. But joy, joy's different. Joy's different because it can't be achieved. To receive it, we have to get out of the way and allow the Holy Spirit to move in our lives and in our hearts. And therein lies the key. Joy's a gift. Joy comes with knowing that God is near and that salvation is offered. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Not just to you and me, but to, to everyone. We're going to be singing it on, on Friday. But the ever popular hymn of praise, you know, Heart the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. The Wesley brothers, John and Charles, they understood that salvation and joy goes hand in hand. You can't have joy without an acute understanding of our own forgiveness and reconciliation. It's the assurance of salvation that's the source of joy. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. The kicker is, how can we open ourselves to to more fully receive the gift of joy, this altogether joy, through Jesus Christ? Well, might I suggest that we hit the pause button? I so love the pause button on the remote. Okay? When interruptions happen, when, when, when I'm trying to watch and Susan wants to talk, pause, okay? She tries to pause me, but she hasn't figured that one out yet, okay? When, when the phone rings, pause. The doorbell chimes, pause. You hit the pause button so you can listen, so you can act, so you can honor the circumstances that are drawing your attention away from what you're doing. It amazes me how much more attentive I can be to Susan when the TV is off and the phone is elsewhere. 
We live busy lives. Christmas brings high expectations, and, and the clamor of preparation keeps us focused on, on perfecting the experience. Christmas, as we celebrate it, almost, uh, it, it's, it's about the almost. The gifts we bring, how many of us remember the majority of them from year to year? How many of you can remember all the gifts you received last year? I don't see any hands. You know? And yet the pressure for that perfect gift this year is incredible. The hymns of Christmas are beautiful. They lift the heart. But having heard them since, since Halloween, you start to get tired of them after a while. It's a busy, busy, busy time of year. So maybe it's time to pause for a chance we can open ourselves to more fully receive the gift of an altogether joy through Jesus Christ, through the simplicity of the pause. Could it be that the pause is silencing the heart and the soul and the mind and the body? Could it be that this is the key to opening our heart to experiencing the joy of Jesus Christ? I think of Elijah. Elijah was running from Jezebel and he, he failed to find God except in the silence. Remember Zechariah was silenced by God as he awaited the birth of John. That silence perhaps gave him time to ponder the words of the angel. He will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Even before he is born, he will bring back many of the people to Israel, to the Lord their God. And he will get on before the Lord. Turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Remember Jesus? Upon hearing the words of God declaring, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Words that any son would love to hear. Words that, that I believe can only have been heard with a joyful heart. Then Jesus paused what he was doing and he went out into the wilderness. He stopped everything so that he could clarify the voices of good and evil in his life and choose whom he would follow. Henry Nouwen sees opening the heart as an exercise in prayer. Not only conveying our wishes to the divine, but finding joy and contentment in God's promises. And Nouwen says this, to pray means to open your hands before God. It means slowly relaxing the tension that squeezes your hands together, accepting your existence with an increasing readiness, not as a possession to defend, but as a gift to receive. Above all, he says, prayer is a way of life that allows you to find stillness in the midst of the world where you open your hands to God's promises and you find hope for yourself, hope for your neighbor, and hope to your world. In prayer, you encounter God not only in, in the small voice and, and the soft breeze, but also in the midst of, of the turmoil of the world, in the distress and the joy of your neighbor and in the loneliness of your own heart. Prayer leads you to new paths, to hear new melodies in the air. Prayer is the breath that gives your life, gives you the freedom to go and to do and to stay where you wish, to find the many signs that, that point out the way to the new land. Praying is not simply some 
necessary compartment in the daily schedule of a Christian or, or this source of support in time of need, nor is it restricted to Sunday mornings or, or meal times or, or bedtime. Prayer is living. It's eating and drinking and acting and resting. It's teaching and learning and playing and working. Praying pervades every aspect of our lives. It's the unceasing recognition that God is wherever we are, always inviting us to come closer and to celebrate the divine gift of being alive. In the end, a life of prayer is a life which open hands, a life where we need not be ashamed of our weaknesses, but realize that it is more perfect for us to be led by the other than to try to hold on to everything in our own hands. When we open our hands, when we open our hearts, we realize just what it is that God is assuring us of. As we comprehend the overwhelming release from sin, as we experience the fullness of God's mercy and forgiveness, God makes a miracle well up within us. Joy. It's indescribable. It's uncontainable. Altogether joy. Ours becomes an altogether joy and an incredible gift from the almighty and everlasting Lord of life. And we know Christmas is coming. The Lord is near. And for once, for once in our lives, that's enough. Amen?